Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Um, before I introduce uh, today's uh, distinguished speaker, this is the second of our seminars this uh, semester. I'd like to uh, announce our next uh, meeting, which is on uh, November 11th. Um, and we have a uh, well-known Indonesianist, Ian Wilson, uh, speaking about um, Indonesian politics, uh, and that will be uh, also at 4 p.m. on a Monday. But today I'm very pleased indeed to uh, introduce and have with us um, Professor Edmund Terence Gomez uh, from the University of Malaya. And for any of you here who know the literature on Southeast Asian political economy or on the literature on Malaysian politics and economics, will know uh, Terence's name well. Um, when one introduces scholars, um, one can talk about their books and their appointments and so on, but uh, I think there's no doubt, as I just said, uh, Terence is a pillar of uh, political economy studies of Southeast Asia. So we're very pleased indeed. He's currently professor of political economy at the Faculty of Economics and Administration, University of Malaya, specializing in state market relations and linkages between politics, policies, and enterprise development. He's held appointments at the University of Leeds, Murdoch University in Australia, and served as a visiting professor at Kobe University in Japan and at uh, the American Universities of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and California, San Diego. Between 2005 and 2008, he was a research coordinator at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And his many publications include uh, Malaysia's Political Economy, that's Cambridge 1997, um, a number of books on uh, Malaysia, East Asia or Malaysia, uh, published by Routledge, uh, 2002 and 2004, Palgrave Macmillan, 2012, um, his National University of Singapore book on new economic policy in Malaysia, 2013, uh, a Palgrave book about uh, the Minister of Finance Incorporated Ownership and Control of Corporate Malaysia, and I just discovered a book coming out uh, in two weeks on the Malaysian elections of 2018 with their very surprising results indeed uh, with some very distinguished scholars in that, um, in that book which we're very much looking forward to. So um, allow me uh, to um, turn over the floor and let us warmly welcome uh, Terence Gomez. Thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I would like to spend this afternoon discussing the regime change that occurred in Malaysia. It was completely unexpected. Nobody thought that uh, unknown that the hegemonic single dominant party in Malaysia would lose power because of the gerrymandering and all the other forms of cheating that was instituted just before the election. But change occurred. Today my talk is on state business relations. I'm focusing specifically on that issue to try and show you how little things have changed since the change. So there's been change without change. So let me start first by discussing the political system. Now, when there is a change from authoritarian rule to democracy, the literature will argue, will indicate that uh, it takes time to institute these changes. And it is always characterized by political and economic problems. The, what makes the Malaysian case far more interesting, even more difficult to institute changes, is that the new regime comprises members of the old regime. And many of the problems that we see in Malaysia today, including the close nexus between government and business, was created by the current Prime Minister himself, as well as the Prime Minister in waiting. So if they created the problems, uh, we really to expect them to change the system, especially the system that he knows so well, which shall bring them to power in the first place. The second issue also is this. Although there is a new co coalition called Pakatan Harapan, or the coalition of hope, it is characterized by deep fragmentation. Mahathir and Anwar are deep-seated enemies. So it was really strange to see them coming together, but they came together for one sole reason, to overthrow Najib Razak. And they knew they had to work together to do it. But one morning they woke up and they found that they were in power together. Again. But those deep-seated differences have not gone away. 
But yet the plan is this, Mahathir will serve as Prime Minister for two years and Anwar will then take over. That seems increasingly unlikely. Now the second issue here which I would like to talk about is the corporate sector, state business class. Traditionally we talk about public-private partnerships, public-private linkages that have long been in place between the government and big businesses. We also see linkages between the government and multinational companies. The links between government and big businesses, long, long stable relationships, are developmental in nature, but they have also been patronages. They are ridden with right seeking corruption. But they do have a developmental aspect. When the rents are given, they are uh, employed in a manner in which it brings it contributes to economic growth. But there's another type of link between government and business that I like to draw attention to, what I call public public. We have not studied much this link between the government and its control of companies, government linked companies as they are called in Malaysia. They're also known as state owned enterprises. There's a huge literature on state owned enterprises, but I'm drawing specific attention to another dimension of these public enterprise, these state owned enterprises, that is the link between GLCs, Malaysian, in Malaysia they're called government linked companies, and state owned enterprises from China. I am arguing that just before the fall of the government, a new type of relationship occurred, a new type of state business occurred, what I call public public, that is between GLCs from Malaysia and state-owned enterprises from China. The institutional architecture of GLCs controlled by the party is, is one which is deeply entrenched and has proven to be a mechanism which, uh, I'll show you later, which Mahathir created, basically to try and redistribute wealth more actively, but was hijacked by the party to serve his own political interest. When Najib came to power, he used this institutional architecture not for the practice of patronage per se, but basically to serve his own political interests, to serve his own vested personal interests. And that led to the problem of kleptocracy, which we then saw. Najib was the, when Najib involved the GLCs or plundered the GLCs, that was the first time in fact we had seen in Malaysian history the problem of kleptocracy. So there are different forms of institutional architecture here when we talk about how GLCs are used as well as the links between GLCs and SOEs. So the main question I want to pose is this. Now you basically know what the state of play was like before the fall. So what I would like to discuss today is what happens in terms of dismantling rent seeking and patronage based state business lines, both public-private as well as public-private, public-public. When a new regime which comprises politicians of the old regime comes into power. And how will they use this system? Will they really reform it? Or will they then try to use the system to reconsolidate power themselves? But before I get into that, a bit of history is required. The nature of state business life has really got a long history. It goes back to the 1970s. In fact, 1970, when the government decided to intervene in the economy in a big way, primarily to redress uh, the inequities of British colonial rule. British colonial rule had led to the problem of uh, the control of a great segment of the corporate sector under foreign, under foreign enterprises. And these foreign enterprises were predominantly British and French companies. So they introduced then affirmative action to redistribute wealth. They also created what is then known as public enterprises to work. Much funds were pumped into the public enterprises which were then used to acquire these assets, these foreign owned assets. And then they were supposed to be redistributed through these public enterprises, which were later renamed GLCs. So the first person to do that was Prime Minister Tunandu Raza. He introduced the GLC system, if you like. Then Mahathir came to power. Mahathir changed the system. The state business relationship changed significantly under Mahathir. He decided that GLCs should not be with the government. They should be corporatized and then privatized. And he instituted a practice of massive privatization, which led to the rise of a new rich. The new rich collapsed after the 1997 crisis, and that led to the renationalization of many of these large firms, and GLCs again then became prominent in the economy. The Prime Minister that followed, Abdul Ahmad Badawi, decided he was not going to focus on big business. He was not interested in big business like Mahathir was. His focus was on small and medium scale enterprises. There was a logic to this. Abdullah realized that the corporate sector constitutes 
SMEs constitute 98% of the corporate sector. So why work with a small group of bis big businesses when I can practice patronage through affirmative action that targets 98% of the corporate sector? And so his focus was on SMEs. Majid came to power and decided it was not worth the effort. These SMEs that get these assets, well, they are well and good, but why distribute them? Why distribute rents to them when I can keep them for myself? So he went back to the system of the GLCs and he said, I have this enormous corporate base under my own control and I can use that to serve my own interests as well as to consolidate political power. So he returned to the use of GLCs in the economy. So you can see the way state business links operate in an economy, in the Malaysian economy, vary from prime minister to prime minister depending on what they felt was the most important segment of the corporate sector that they wanted to use to serve their political and personal interests. The outcomes have been this. They have been programmatic. As you, can, as you know, Malaysia's economy has industrialized rather rapidly. The World Bank referred to it as one of the miracle economies of East Asia. But while it has been pro programmatic, I must also stress that much of that development was brought about because it's a very open economy and Malaysia grew by drawing in foreign direct investments in a big way. And that growth was also predominantly driven by MNCs. But that is not to say that the big firms were not productive. They were productive too, with the runs that you got from the state, as I mentioned earlier. But there's also been extensive predatory issues, linked issues such as back range and rent seeking, which has been a characteristic of Mahathir's administration. His administration was going to be extremely corrupt but of a different sort of corruption compared to what we saw under Najib. So when we talk about Malaysia's political economy, it's been shaped by state business relations that has involved SMEs on one hand, as well as GLCs, as well as business groups, and I'll expose you to, to that. We've also seen technological upgrading because the state has had some element of disciplining when distributing rents, especially to the bigger firms, because the idea is this, if I give you these rents, can you please continue to make profits on a long-term basis because the more profits you make, the more political financing I can get. So they tended to identify businessmen who were, who had the know-how to take these rents and create big firms, and they did. And some of these fir firms even went abroad. And these firms have been financing these political parties, especially UMNO. Remember, UMNO is part of a coalition. And there are 12 members in the Barca National Coalition, of which UMNO was hegemony. But what is also important was the persistent use of affirmative action, race-based affirmative, affirmative action, action targeting the Malays, or whom we put process, they are referred to in Malaysia. Now, this kind of targeting has been important because UMNO's main uh, political base is the rural areas which are predominantly Bumiputra, predominantly Malay. And that's why affirmative action continues to remain in place, although it was supposed to have stopped after 20 years. But the important point to remember here is affirmative action, although targeting rural areas and the poor, has been hijacked by UMNO to serve the interests of UMNO members themselves. This is the reason why UMNO became a business-based party. UMNO members are predominantly businessmen. Now the other issue which is a prelude before I get into the data is this. There have been critical junctures in Malaysian history that we should be aware of. The more recent critical juncture that we should know is 2008, when we had the global financial crisis. This is an important juncture in Malaysian history because at that point, they realized they have to reform the system. The system is just not working anymore. But they didn't seize that opportunity. In fact, they didn't seize that opportunity to bring about the change because UMNO refused to change the patronage system that was in place. UMNO refused to change it because its members wanted to keep that patronage system because it served as a mechanism for them to secure rents from the state, ostensibly because it's supposed to be given to Bumi Putras and it's a party of Bumi Putras, so they get the rents. Najib knew he had to change it. He recommended enormous changes, but in the end, didn't go ahead with it. In fact, he introduced what was called market-friendly affirmative action, but by this time, nobody thought that this was going to work anymore because affirmative action, even if it's market-friendly, and that's an oxymoron, really, even if it was market friendly, was not inspiring confidence in domestic investors to invest in the economy because it served as a mechanism for a strong state to expropriate wealth from businesses if the state so wished to do so. So market friendly affirmative action as a mechanism to try and resolve the problem of domestic investors not investing in the economy didn't work. 
The next big idea emerged in 2013, when Najib nearly lost power. He thought that he had done enough to win in that election, and when he saw the results, he realized that the non malays were voting against him in a big way. So he changed that, and he went back to race-based policies, very clear race-based policies, to consolidate Malay political support. He was willing to sacrifice domestic investments in the country. But he was fortunate by one important thing. Just prior to that, Xi Jinping came to power, and he introduced what was known as his major policy, the Belt Road Initiative. The Belt Road Initiative talked about investments by SOEs, talked about investments by SOEs also in South Asia. And one country that he targeted was the peninsula, the Malayan Peninsula, which is a very important segment of the DRI. And he was more than willing to invest heavily in Malaysia. And this led to what I call state-state times. Two strong states, UMNO, a hegemonic single dominant party, working with the Communist Party from China. Two strong men coming together and dictating investment patterns. And SOEs from China began to invest in a big way in Malaysia. And that, to a large extent, saved, saved Najib in terms of allowing economic growth. The third issue, which is very important, although there were investments in the economy, what, Ma what Najib had not expected was the fracture within UMNO. Elites fighting, feuding. Mahathir particularly upset with the kleptocratic nature of the state. And Mahathir leading the party, forming his own party, and then taking on Najib, which eventually led to the demise of UMNO in the, next, in the subsequent election. So here, what I'm going to show you now is the state of play when Najib fell. I'm going to show you now the data on the state business relationship that had occurred, that had been instituted when Najib fell, and then I'll talk about how things have not changed. The first issue, what I call public-public, which I'd like to draw attention to in this discussion, is what we call the business of the ministries. Now, Malaysia has got 25 uh, ministries in the cabinet, and an interesting phenomenon about these ministries is that these ministries own companies. They own GLCs. And among these GLCs, among these 25 ministries, the, what I call the big four, are the Prime Minister's Department, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Rural and Regional Development, and the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation. Mahate, in the 1990s, late 1990s, after falling out with every finance minister he had, decided one day that he was going to be the finance minister. That was unprecedented. So the Prime Minister became the Finance Minister, and since then, every Prime Minister after him decided he too is going to be the Minister of Finance, because it was too important a ministry to relinquish control to someone else, because then someone else would use this powerful Ministry of Finance, which owns many companies, to unseat the Prime Minister. So let me just show you the big four. This is the big four. I'm not showing you all. Let me also explain the legends. What you see in blue, or dark blue, with the names PMD, MRRD, MOSTI, and MOF are the names of the ministries. Now they own what is known in purple as GLICs, government linked investment companies. There are several of them, they are major government linked companies, investment companies, and they in turn own many, what you can see in purple, companies which are called GLCs. What you see in yellow, or orange are what we call statutory bodies. These statutory bodies also own GLCs. So this is the GLC world. It's a huge world. When we wrote the book Minister of Finance Incorporated, we, we identified this system and we realized that this system that we have captured here by no means, by no means reflects the reality of how many businesses the government owns. And we did this just through sheer hard work, trying by, you know, by connecting the dots and following one company to the other. We created this. And when we went and tried to get the actual data, no ministry was willing to tell us exactly how many companies they own. In fact, I can tell you now, even the government people had no clue how many GLCs there were. It was a system that was now completely out of control. Every minister was doing it. So I'm just showing you here the big four. 
Now let me take you through the big four in terms of, let me break this down. This is the Prime Minister's Department, and you can see the Prime Minister's Department controls, I won't go, go into it, because you don't know these companies, and there's no need for you to go to know these companies anyway. But just to show you that he had an enormous wealth of corporate assets under him, and among the most important assets was Petronas, which is the oil company, Malaysia's National Oil Corporation, which was a major company for him. Felda was very important because there was the land redistribution firm that was created in the 1950s, which has a huge political base. Now here, I'll show you what these companies do. So if you look at this table, the Prime Minister's Department controls GLCs, which interestingly enough do many things. They do social work, they do religious work, and they also do economic work. So it's not just that these businesses do business. They also have social obligations. And what was, as I said, especially interesting for us was that how deeply involved they are also involved in religious affairs. The LGH is the Lubanda Papakaji. You know, when people go to do their Hajj, they've got a special enterprise for that. It's a major investment company which has got huge assets. Now, below that, you will see how politicians are appointed as chairman of these huge enterprises. And then these companies then become a mechanism for the practice of patronage. The reason why they set up all these companies was because through this system, with this magnitude of companies, they could appoint politicians as directors of these companies. Through this magnitude of companies, they could channel rents to these companies, which will then go on to be redistributed to party members. And that's why this system was not dismantled after 2008. It was just too lucrative a system for them to dismantle. But this was all done in the name of a social policy called affirmative action, ostensibly to help the poor. But as you can see now, I'm showing you, I'm showing you how the system works. And the system, as I said, does many things. And this is just the Prime Minister's Department. Now, this is the Ministry of Finance. This was really a very powerful ministry. And this was a ministry which controlled most of the key uh, investment companies, including the Sovereign Wealth Fund, Kazana, a major investment fund, uh, PNB, which was created to, to buy assets from uh, private shareholders, especially the foreigners for redistribution, to the Malays, PNB, a major enterprise. This enterprise, this MOF structure, is particularly important for one important reason, in the new regime. It was decided in the run-up to the election that the Prime Minister can no longer be the Minister of Finance. After all, with the Prime Minister being Minister of Finance, we had the infamous 1MDB scandal. And you saw the magnitude of that scandal. It had worldwide implications. So when Prime Minister Mahathir came to power second time, and he was told you cannot be Minister of Finance, he took important companies from the Ministry of Finance, like the Sovereign Wealth Fund, Kazana, and PNB, and he transferred it to the Prime Minister's Department. He weakened the Minister of Finance, and he made the Finance Minister a member of the DAP, which was, although it appeared like, to, like this was a major appointment, the Democratic Action Party's Lin Wan Ng is now the Minister of Finance, he, was, he had already been dismembered, MOF had been dismembered. And although Prime Minister Mahathir was now no longer could not be finance minister, he basically controlled two of the major government-linked investment companies which gave him enormous control over publicly listed firms. Just by taking Kazana and PNB, he now had control over some of the largest companies in the country. You get the point? You see the change or lack of it? Ministry of Finance also does many things. Economic, social, regional development, regulatory, they do everything. This system is really complex and has to be reformed. And one of the things we thought they would reform was this. But here again, too, we have not seen any change. Now, this ministry, if you look at it, Ministry of Rural and Regional Development, you'll be wondering, why is rural and regional development so important? And why is it so huge? For the simple reason, as I said earlier, UMNO's major constituency base were the rural areas. It was always, this, the minister for this ministry was always a senior UMNO member, a vice president, no less. And as you can see, here, the major institutions that they used were not investment arms, but in yellow, what are known as statutory bodies. These statutory bodies 
created a whole slew of GLCs which were deeply embedded in rural areas. And to that, they could practice the distribution of rents to the electorate. So this was a mechanism to capture support in rural areas too. This is why, as you look here, you can see this. What it does is land development, regional development, land redistribution, it does many things too. Now this system, this system, let me stress this, can work <coughs> if we don't have all the GLCs. If you just have the statutory bodies, and these statutory bodies go down into the rural areas, they can bring about land development. They have shown it to work. They can bring about land redistribution. This system can help alleviate poverty. And it did in the 1970s, until it was hijacked by UMNO and became a tool for the practice of political patronage. And it became a tool for, as I said, plundering from the state back uh, to, to secure rents from the state to serve their own vested interests. And as you can see here, this was a ministry where there were, new, there were numerous statutory bodies were all controlled by politicians. And politicians love controlling these institutions because under the budget they received an enormous volume of money which they could then send down to the ground to consolidate their own personal political needs. Now I want to come to this, the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. You all may think that the previous ones are com complete waste of time, purely predatory in nature. But then we have the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, mostly. And if you look at what it does, financing industries, R&D, research and development, technological development. It does important things. It does transfer enormous or important rents, technological based rents, financing primarily to small and medium scale enterprises. But look also below there at the number of politicians who are present in this ministry. Here you will find only one and he's a non, he's a but I don't know who this man was when I put down his name. It was so insignificant. It was not an important ministry for politicians. It was, a, it was for technocrats. It was an important ministry which did get rents down to the ground. So here you're seeing the developmental nature or the programmatic part of the state. This was happen, happening simultaneously while the other things were also happening. And this to some extent explains why the SMEBs in the country still continue to perform well. This explains why also there are some major firms. And I'd like to show you some of them. Here is, while well, I showed you earlier public, public forms of relationships, here I go back to the public-private. Here are the top 50 business groups. The ones in red are the GLCs. And if you look at the top 10, eight of them are GLCs. Now you know why Mahathir wanted to secure control of the G of Kazana and PNB, because he controls all these major companies, he controls the major banks, he controls Petronas, the oil corporation, he controls the healthcare sector, he controls the plantation sector, he controls the telecommunications sector. Which is why he wanted control of, as I say, Kazan and PNB, it gives him enormous control over publicly listed firms. But if you look at black, as you go down, you will see a lot more companies in black. These are primarily large family-owned enterprises. These enterprises are important because they are conglomerates, they are multi-sectoral, they are into many areas of the economy, they are productive, they are led by highly entrepreneurial men, they've been around for a long time, but they have also secured very close ties with the state. Many of these people are on personal terms with the Prime Minister, the previous Prime Minister, in fact I would say all the Prime Ministers. Also because there's an element of political financing here too. Now that's why when there was regime change, it was not difficult for Mahathir to get back into, the, into a relationship with these firms. And that's why it was not difficult for these firms to get back into a relationship with the existing regime. One would have thought the regime changed out there, this mantling of all these nexuses that we have seen, this, including these public-private firms, and the nexuses that we had had for a long time, with UMNO, this has not changed. We have just seen a shift. So in terms of public-private relationships, again here we are not seeing much changes. And then I want to come to this, the new, the new research that we've been doing, what we call public-public of a different sort. China in Malaysia, China's SOEs. 
Here I'm only drawing attention to the mega projects. Many of them are BRI linked, the Penang Under Sea Tunnel, the East Coast Railway Link, which is extremely, extremely important to China because it links the west coast of the peninsula to the east coast of the peninsula. And then the east coast of the peninsula, there in the state of Pahang, you will see we have control of a major port, we have a major industrial park. It is truly a major industrial park. The investments by Chinese firms in Malaysia have not have been quite productive too. And these investments have helped the economy to grow. This was really a boon for Najib, as I said. And if you go down south, you will see Malacca again. You can see the ports are very important. Control the ports. It gives them access to the BRI. It's all part of the BRI network. And if you go down south you, towards Singapore, you will see Johor, Forest City, another major, major area next to Singapore, where you will see a, a, a huge property development come industrial park being created. So here, I'm just drawing attention to some of the mega projects which were among the first to be started under Najib. But subsequently, we saw others coming in during the period from 2013 to 2018, until now. And here, what I'm showing you is the different types of state business ties involving firms from China, what I call state-state, that's between GLCs and SOEs, state-state private GLCs, SOEs and private firms, either from Malaysia or from China, state private private, state, firm, uh, state meaning GLCs, with private firms of China as well as private firms of Malaysia, state private, private private and Chinese firms only. So with the entry of China into Malaysia, we didn't see one type of state business relation. We saw many types of state business relations, making this even far more complex. While the big firms, while these were really mega projects, many of these were not mega projects. And many of them, when we broke it down, you will see here again, industrial and manufacturing sector, quite a large number of them. They are into services, infrastructure, they are into many sectors of the economy. And the, when we look at state state, we will see that primarily in, of course, infrastructure, but also in industrial and manufacturing. So the point here is this, while public public ties have been created, not all of them were just major mega projects involving BRI involving the BRI. There have also been other types of investments from China into Malaysia. Chinese firms have come in in a big way. Mahathir had argued that, was, that this was not necessarily good for the economy. He was right. When it comes to the mega projects, it involved a lot of rent seeking. The ERL project was highly inflated. It was inflated to the tune of 61 billion Malaysian ringgit, and out of that, at least 15 billion was supposed to be channeled back to Najib himself, so that he could use that to bail himself out from the 1MDB scandal. So China was also implicit in much of the wrongdoings that we see here, but there is this productive dimension too, as I pointed out here. So here what you're seeing is the very forms of state business relations that were already existing in place before the government fell. Mahathir said that he was going to dismantle this. What happened after he came to power? He didn't. In fact, he took it on board. Initially, he wanted to stop it. Then he realized how lucrative it was. And now, if you look at some of these major projects, I can tell you now, some of these major projects are being taken over by new elites in the government. And Mahathir has approved this also because it's a mechanism to draw investments from China. If you look at the latest budget, there's a lot of incentives to keep China in Malaysia and to continue to draw SMEs, uh, SOEs into the country. So, let's look at the politics of the state now. What's happening now? Mahathir's party, Pakatan Harapan, or the coalition of both, PH, is a coalition of uh, the Deep Democratic Action Party, Mahathir's party, the Satu, and other Islamic based party called Amana, and the DAP. Mahathir's party is the second smallest party. And then there's Anwar's party, PKR, the Justice Party. Anwar's party is the largest party. Anwar Ibrahim is really powerful in the sense that he controls most of the seats in parliament, at least as far as Pakatan is concerned. DAP is second. 
Mahabe has only 12 seats. And the, sec the smallest is Ambada, formerly from the Islamic, a breakaway from the Islamic party with 11. With Mahabe having only 12 seats, why is Mahabe so powerful? Today, we are seeing a case of the rise of the strong man. Mahabe returns as the strong man. Mahabe has complete control over the cabinet. The cabinet is completely subservient to him. In fact, there is a kitchen cabinet involving Mahathir and his former finance minister, Daim Zainuddin. Both of them appear to be in sole control of the political system as well as the economic system. So we are seeing here now, slowly but surely, the re-emergence of authoritarianism. We are seeing now the re-emergence of the practice of political patronage. The institutional structure, architecture that was created by Mahathir has not been dismantled. Although he himself called it a monster that had grown completely out of control. One of the first things we thought he would do was break it up, reform it, use it to serve the public interest. But instead he has kept quiet about it. And he's using it to do exactly what he was doing in the past, practice patronage. Why? Because as I showed you, especially the Ministry of Rural and Regional Development reaches right into the Malay Heartland states and his party is a Malay based party and he's got so little support from among rural based Malays, this system is just far too important for him to dismantle. He needs to keep that system in place so that he can reconsolidate his power base in rural areas because they tend to still support UMNO and the Islamic party pass. The other issue which is also important is policies. We thought that we are going to see major policy reforms. So the rhetoric is identify a new form of intervention. The state is going to continue to be interventionist. There's not going to be this real new liberal type policies, including privatization, so they said. But there has been no reassessment of the forms of intervention in the state. The rhetoric is they're going to reform the GLCs, but there's been no reform of the GLCs, as I said. In fact, ministers still control the GLCs. Politicians are still appointed as directors. They still get a huge stipend which is going back into the political system as financing of politics. There's been talk about reviewing the mega projects, the Chinese projects run by the SOEs. There has been no reform of those projects too. In fact, there's also been talk about extending the FDI base to bring in a diverse form, diverse sources, not just China. But if you look at even the budget which was just released two weeks ago, they mentioned only one country in the budget. And that's China. Of the 190 odd countries in the world, I asked the finance minister in one open dialogue, why is it that only one country gets a mention in the dialogue, and that's China? So, my conclusion are we seeing accumulation? No. In fact, we're going back to the old. There have been no radical reforms, there's no political will to bring about real change. The policies that Mahathir is articulating are policies that he used to articulate in the 1980s when he first came to power. Mahathir, as I said, has emerged as a strong man, economic decision making. is concentrated in his hands. The Minister of Finance may be Lim Guan Yin from the DAP, but he really has no decision making. Making powers of any influence that we can see. Meanwhile, the concentration of powers, I mentioned the big four, the Prime Minister's Department, the Rural and Regional Development, <coughs> and the, I, I, I just pointed out four here. The Prime Minister's Department today <coughs> controls the largest publicly listed uh, companies. He created an economic affairs ministry, they control the largest GLCs. He created or he reconstituted the rural development, they, con they control the statutory bodies and the Minister of Entrepreneurial Development controls the SMEs. He controls all the four different types of enterprises that function in the economy, who are major players in the economy. So basically Mahathe and his party members control the corporate sector. That's what we are seeing today. In terms of state business ties, as I pointed out, they are rather diverse. We need to understand this diversity when we talk about the reforms that need to be instituted. But again, whether there's any political will to reinstitute these reform, to institute these reforms <coughs> and to make something meaningful of the state business ties, we are not seeing it. Meanwhile, Mahathir promised that he would stand down after two years. He's now backtracking. Recently he said three years, and more recently he said maybe I'll wait until I finish my five year term. Anwar on the, is waiting on the sidelines. Mahathir has no intention of allowing Anwar to come to power. 
There's a big dispute going on in the country about the succession issue. This is undermining investor confidence. And it is clear that there is a brewing fight between Mahate and Anwar. What are the implications of this? We can already see it's there. It's going to happen. We are expecting a major political feud to occur in the coming months. The Malaysian situation, political situation today, is one, as far as I'm concerned, is one that's in a crisis state. It is deeply undermining, deeply undermining investments in the country, and it has disillusioned Malaysians to a high degree. One year after the radical fall, unexpected fall of UMNO, today we are looking at what had happened last year and wondering where did it all go wrong. Thank you. So, if there are no further questions, uh, all that remains uh, to do is to say once again thank you very much for a fascinating talk.